concrete, and all of it must be recycled. Only these engineers will attempt to do it in a revolutionary new way. Just keep rolling, baby. They'll turn spans into ships and sail them away, all in less than 48 hours. But with innovation comes risk. We're pushing everything to the limit. Two functioning bridges stand dangerously close on either side. And nothing can touch the water. In the San Francisco Bay Area of California, drivers rely on bridges to overcome an incredible natural obstacle, water. A series of inlets, including San Francisco Bay. A body of water stretching up to 19 kilometers wide and 96 kilometers long. Seven large bridges carry more than 400,000 cars across the bays every day. In the northeast, three bridges sit side by side, spanning the Carquinas Strait. This is where it all started in 1927. In the middle stands the once famous Carquinas Bridge. It was the first major bridge in the Bay Area. She was one of the world's longest highway bridges when she was built in 1927. Eighty years ago, her three lanes were a traffic savior. Today, they're not enough. 109,000 cars cross this strait every day. The grand old car Kinas isn't big enough to handle the load and she's too expensive to maintain. She must come down. This is how it's usually done. But that won't work for the Carquinas. An explosion could damage the neighboring bridges the one to the east sits just 40 meters away. The other even closer. But the Carquinas isn't just blocked in from the sides. It's also blocked in underneath. If any piece enters the strait below, it will pollute a protected habitat for seabirds, seals, and other wildlife, including rare and endangered species. Toxic lead paint covers nearly every part of the metal structure. When the California Department of Transportation decommissioned the bridge in 2005, they requested bids to see who could pull down the Carquinas in the right way for the best price. Five contracting firms entered their bids. Most wanted to use large and expensive water-based equipment to dismantle the bridge. But one small firm, California Engineering Contractors, had a different idea. Their plan? To bring down each 630-ton section all at once by lowering them with cables onto two awaiting barges. Each bridge span would become a vessel wider than the width of an aircraft carrier and be pushed away by tugboats. Not only has this innovative technique never been attempted, California engineering contractors claims it can do it for just $18 million, $10 million less than the nearest competitor. Their low bid wins them the job, but they have a secret plan to recoup some of the money. Recycling.
workers hack at the bridge day and night. There's some 22,000 tons of steel and concrete in the Carquinas. Properly recycled, the steel alone is worth more than $2 million. Project manager David Piermarini has planned this job for eight months. There's little to no waste on a demolition project like this. What we do here on the job site is we cut it up into, into members that are manageable, put it into trailers and different uh, types of containers, and they bring it right over to the scrapyard. A crew gets to work on the south end of the bridge. Heavy machinery pulls down the concrete towers. Steel rods called rebar sit inside the concrete to give it strength. This rebar will also be recycled. Bridge engineer Jay Coleman knows there's value in every scrap of steel. The steel industry has been recycling for a long time because of just the, the driving economics behind it. It's cheaper to harvest steel from this old column than it is to harvest iron ore from the ground and make new steel. Even the rubble will be pulverized and made into roads. It's a steel cantilever truss bridge that we're taking apart. There's 12,000 tons of steel as well as a significant amount of concrete, and we're tasked with completely removing the bridge so that when we're all done with this project, there will be no trace. This is a dream for an engineer to be a part of something like this, and this is why we do this. But the biggest challenge sits 15 stories above the water, the suspended middle spans. The innovative plan to lower the middle spans in one piece means smaller crews can safely and efficiently salvage the steel on land. It will be another big saving if the crews can pull it off. Each span stretches longer than a jumbo jet, stands as tall as a 10-story building, and weighs more than 635 tons. There's no textbook for this kind of teardown. It's a world first. But the team has a bold idea. They will determine how the bridge was constructed and then reverse the process. The blueprints for their strategy will be based on methods used by engineers 80 years ago. What we're doing here is not very different from how they built the bridge. Physics uh, are the same, gravity is the same. In 1927, Steelworkers assembled the giant center spans on a dock. They then floated them on barges underneath the already constructed towers. They rigged the spans to cable and pulley systems connected to gigantic sand-filled counterweights. When engineers released the counterweights, the spans on the barges became the world's largest elevators rising into place in less than an hour. Workers then connected the spans to the towers and completed the major part of the bridge's construction. In theory, a similar system should work in reverse. But eight decades ago, the Carquinas wasn't flanked by other structures. And the water below wasn't a protected habitat. One thing is the same. Lives depend on getting it right. A wrong calculation could be catastrophic. A delicate feat of engineering requiring precise science is needed to safely take down the 80-year-old Carquinas Bridge. Bridge engineer Jay Coleman 
must first calculate exactly how much the spans weigh. If we don't put enough thought into it, and if we don't do things step by step, um, you know, you could get into trouble overloading the structure. It's in very close proximity to two lifeline bridges. Anything we do here can't damage those adjacent structures. The only weight they know for sure is the weight of the spans when they went up in 1927. 635 tons each. But those spans were raised before the concrete and steel road was laid over top. We really study the process of how the, the structure was built in the first place because the, the simplest thing to do is to do a reverse engineering to look at what seemed to work for the original contractor back in 1927. Reverse engineering a span requires stripping it of its concrete surface and steel road supports to get it back to its original weight. Workers rip up the road with heavy machinery. Chief mechanic Hector Macias must keep it all running. It's pretty intense work. We got a bobcat, we got man lifts, we got welders, generators, and compressors. And it all happens during one of California's wettest years. 825 millimeters of rain in just two months. It was raining cats and dogs. I mean, I had to change my boots three times one day, and I ran out of boots. <laughs> High winds and cold rain make an already dangerous job more so. Lunch, whatever you want to do for about one and there's another problem for Hector. As the road around the main crane is stripped, the rig is left stranded on a tower of steel. The crane will lower the smaller equipment once the spans are down but nothing can lower the 54-ton crane itself. Its fate is sealed. It will get cut up, lowered in pieces, and recycled with the rest of the bridge. It's all part of the plan, and the only way to get the job done. With the roadway now gone, the spans weigh what they did 80 years ago. Now, the engineers know exactly how much weight they must lower. But the lighter spans are less stable and more vulnerable to the San Francisco Bay's high winds. The engineers know from history, a strong gale and an unstable bridge can be a disastrous combination. Nineteen forty, Tacoma, Washington. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge opens with great fanfare. Nearly a mile across, it is the third longest suspension bridge in the world. But months later, a storm brings sixty-four kilometer per hour winds, and the bridge begins to oscillate. The winds stay steady, and the shaking worsens each hour. Finally. The cables holding up the roadway can no longer take the tension. The Tacoma Narrows comes down in a heap of twisted steel. The Carquinas, stripped of its roadway, is also susceptible to high winds. Right now, each span is a shell and more vulnerable than ever. Engineers want to bring down the spans as soon as possible, but they'll only do so in calm weather. So far, project manager David Piermarini has had no luck. The winds keep exceeding the safety limit for lowering 24 kilometers per hour. We set it up on three different occasions and had to postpone it on three different occasions. Every delay increases the chance of the bridge being hit by gale force winds. Tomorrow's forecast calls for winds pushing 24 kilometers per hour. 
It's right on the limit and a tough call. The Coast Guard must close the strait below for the operation, but they'll only prohibit boat traffic for 48 hours. The strait is an important shipping lane, so David and his crew must finish the job on time. David seizes the small window of opportunity and gives the order to bring the span down. From this point on, workers must race the clock. They start to cut the span loose. To stay on schedule, the 130 meter long section must be cut free from the bridge and hanging from cables by nightfall. The crew uses oxyacetylene blow torches to sever large trusses. These horizontal support beams sit on each side. These trusses will go straight to the recyclers with the rest of the steel structure. The price of steel has risen dramatically in the past few years, and uh, we have 12,000 tons of steel here. There is a strong motivation to go and recycle that steel, sell it to a scrapper who will then recycle that and make it into a new product that he can sell in the open market and make a buck. It will take nearly 1,000 truckloads to move all the steel from the bridge to the recycling yard in nearby Oakland. It can then be sold to manufacturers and made into anything from toys to automobiles, even a new bridge. The Carquinas will have a new life. It is a bridge with a future, but it also links these workers to the past. The last time this span received so much attention was 1927. It has stood so well for so long because its design was ahead of its time. When engineer D.B. Steinman designed the Carquinas, he had to contend with a serious concern, earthquakes. Just 20 years earlier, one of the most significant earthquakes of all time flattened San Francisco. The Great Quake of 1906 shook the ground for an entire minute, killing up to 3,000 people and reducing the city to ruins. Steinman knew he had to come up with some way to protect his bridge from future quakes. It is necessary to take such precautions as we could to make the structure as safe as possible against earthquake effects. To tie the parts of the structure together in the event of an earthquake, hydraulic buffers were provided. These hydraulic buffers were Steinman's answer. He designed them to absorb any shaking. They were an engineering feature a half century before their time. The Carquinas' decommission provides engineer and bridge historian Professor Hassan Astana a unique opportunity to study Steinman's work close up. So when the earthquake comes, the tunnel locks actually. So as far as we know, this was the first bridge that someone came up with the idea of putting dampers and hydraulic jacks to control seismic effect. It's like he is telling us the essence of what we do today 80 years earlier. He just saw it. No one knew for sure if Steinman's buffers would work. The Cypress Pine buckled into It wasn't until 1989 that they were put to the ultimate test. The deck crashing to the bottom deck. The Loma Prieta earthquake registers 7.1 on the Richter scale. It knocks the nearby Bay Bridge out of service. But the 62-year-old Carquinas escapes unscathed. Now, all the engineering that went into building the Carquinas is reversed. 
After eight hours, workers finally cut the last of the horizontal supports. The span is currently connected by four pairs of vertical steel rods called I-bars, one pair on each corner. Workers secure lowering jacks to the top of each set of I-bars. The bottom of the span is then connected to the jacks through a series of steel cables, 19 on each corner. When the jacks are engaged and the I-bars cut, these cables will be all that holds up the 635-ton section of bridge. The jacks can then slowly lower the span. But the span will be an incredible strain, and never before has anyone used jacks to lower a bridge span. They do know that a jack failure could be catastrophic. The moment of reckoning finally arrives. Workers are ready to free the giant span of the Carquinas Bridge, and the four jacks now sit ready to take the weight. The crew prepares to lower the span. Scott Soldis calls the shots. The two riskiest parts of the operation are getting it up on the jacks and then actually touch down on the barges. There's many nights of waking up in the middle of the night and making mental notes of things that need to be done the next day. Your primary responsibility down here is going to be making sure that you're feeding out enough of the tail. Work together on that. It's a matter of uh, getting the right people in the right jobs at that point, not giving them too much information. Get the headphones on, get everybody in their place, and by 7 o'clock we should be lowering. Mechanic Hector Macias must keep the jacks working. Hey, Tim, it don't matter which way you stick the fork in. He'll personally oversee the two jacks on the north side. We have two different controllers, one on the south, one on the north. I'm on the north side taking care of both winches, east and west. Scott, do you have your radio on? Yeah, go ahead. Scott orders the jacks turned on for the first time. The jacks slowly take the slack out of the cables. Now a crucial moment. Before the jacks can lower the span, they must pull the span up so the cables are super tight. If there's any give when the I-bars are cut free, the 635-ton stretch of steel will jerk on the jacks. That momentum could collapse the entire bridge. But lifting the span too much with the I-bars still attached could also cause a catastrophic collapse. If we come up on the load too high, and cause too much compression in the member. You could break the jacks, and you could break the supports, which are holding up the bridge at that point. Everything and everyone would be taken out. The jacks and cables now look to be taking the weight of the span. David orders the I-bars cut. From here, the only way forward is down. There's a point of no return. As soon as we cut the I-bar and transfer the loads onto the strands, then that's it. We have to lower the bridge. They sever the last I-bar. Now the cables alone support the full weight of the span. The entire 635-ton section swings free and lies at the mercy of the wind. To bring the center span down safely, everything must come together at once. The weather, the equipment, the engineering, the current, and the tides. It takes a perfect set of circumstances, and nothing can be rushed. Scott orders the jack operators to stand by. 
This time, they won't lift the span, they'll lower it. The fate of the operation and the lives of those on the bridge depend on the jack's ability to perform. Hector, go ahead and send your jack up to 16 and hold. First, the four jack pistons extend. North side, 16 inches to the top. All right, hold right there, I'll get right back here. Next, metal forks determine which part of the jack grips the cables, either the top or the bottom. North side, bring it to the top. Now, when the pistons retract, the cables should lower the bridge span 40 centimeters. North side forks are in, ready to come down. All right, north and south side, both sides down. 10-4, coming down. The head then will retract 16 inches, lowering the bridge to 16 inches. In one smooth motion, the span makes its first move toward the awaiting barges. It's like using a rope to lower a bucket down a well. No pulley, just one arm's length at a time. Four, I'm going back up. Removing the lower forks clamps the cables in place, freeing the jacks to reach up and repeat the process. It's a very repetitive thing. We move the jacks a certain way, put the forks in, take the forks out, and the strands lower the bridge. So far, the system works. The jacks handle the weight of the 635-ton span. They have a tight deadline to meet. The channel can only be closed for 48 hours. At the current speed, it'll take a full 10 hours just to lower the span, and they still must secure it to the barges. That's when there are no problems, and there's always one little thing that goes wrong. It just takes a long time. The team starts to fall behind schedule. Suddenly, 48 hours doesn't seem like enough time. A little slower than Scott and Oscar, but we'll get our learning. We need to bottom out on this end first. In addition to the slow speed of descent, there's a new problem. The center span begins to tilt. The span is only strong when vertical. If it gets seriously out of alignment, there'll be too much pressure on key girders and the whole span will fold like a house of cards. It happened before with the construction of the Quebec Bridge in 1907. The Quebec Bridge is nearly complete, 270 meters and 18,000 tons when the south arm of the bridge collapses under its own weight. 86 workmen are on the bridge when it buckles, 75 perish. After the tragedy, it takes 10 years to rebuild the bridge. But just as the jacks begin lifting the span up from the water, disaster strikes again. The Quebec Bridge has a single suspended span. It collapsed twice, and they almost got it completely done. And when they were lifting the suspended span into place, one of the jacks failed, and the entire suspended span collapsed. The second mishap kills another 13 workers. Workers bringing down the center spans of the Carquinas Bridge face the same life-threatening danger. And suddenly, that nightmare scenario starts to inch all too close. We're about uh, eight inches tilted uh, east to west, so the west side's about eight inches lower than the east side. And it's just something that's happening with the northwest jack. He seems to be stroking a little further each time. We need to identify the problem.
every centimeter the span falls out of line, it becomes less stable and more prone to collapse. Yeah, well, that, it doesn't make sense. Jay gives the order, stop everything. The operation grinds to a halt with the span uneven and dangling precariously. If they keep going, the jacks lowering the 635-ton span of the Carquinas Bridge will tilt the span dangerously out of alignment. One of the jacks is not keeping pace with the others. This malfunction could cause the span to topple into the water below, taking everything and everyone with it. Mechanic Hector Macias thinks he's found a solution. By accelerating the jack motor on the northeast corner, he's confident he can match the rate of descent of the other three motors and even out the alignment. It looks like that east northeast motor consistently has been about an inch, maybe a half inch a stroke short, so we brought the RPMs up, see if we can pick them up. Southside side hold. Hector, let me know when your lower forks are in. Scott orders a leveling stroke on the northeast corner. It works. All's well again, but not for long. Scott, you got a copy? Over, Scott. The team hits a new snag. You got a tangled vessel over here on one side. The cables twist on their way to the jacks, bunching up into a tangled mess. Trying to feed them through the jacks gets harder and harder, like trying to run a brush through knotted hair. The jam could bring the whole operation to another standstill. We've been having problems because we're pushing everything to the limit. The iron workers wrestle to keep the cables straight near the jack head. But the tangle worsens with each jack stroke. Copy that, hold. Hector, hold that 16, but uh, grab Lupe. It looks like Matt's going to need some help getting the cable. You're pretty tight there in the couple of The tangled cables slow the entire operation to a crawl. There's no time for a problem like this. Cargo ships expect the strait to reopen on time. Commerce depends on it. But the hanging span presents an impassable object. is totally stuck. One of the cables received a permanent kink, and it couldn't go through the jack smoothly. There's only one solution, and it's a last resort. Project manager David Piermarini decides to cut any problem cables. Each weight-bearing cable cut reduces the margin for error. Now, the remaining cables must pick up the span's entire weight. The crew works into the night and then tries again. Some twisted cables remain, so each stroke of the lowering jacks continues to be a chore. They fight more and more tangled cables every bit of the way. They cut a second cable. Scott finally calls the day after 16 hours of non-stop work. Everyone will be back at 6 a.m. After just a few hours of sleep, the tired crew returns to finish the job.
The 635-ton span dangles 15 meters above the strait. On Scott Soldis' command, they fire up the jacks and try again. I'm back in business. At last, the span moves smoothly and the section drops another 40 centimeters. The second cable cut last night made the difference. The team rediscovers its groove. By midday, the span hangs just above the barges. The way things are going, we should make contact within 45 minutes after the barge is in place and ready for us to come down. Anchoring there. Oh, okay, so you guys, yeah, so it'd be easy to read hundreds. The first major handoff of the operation is within reach. Jeff Holfelder prepares to take over. Oh, we still have a good 10 feet to go. Jeff's daunting mission? Catch the 635-ton bridge span from below. We pulled straws and I, I got the wrong straw. <laughs> the bridge gets to within three meters of the water and Jeff starts directing. I'll uh, let Scott know the minute uh, we're getting close. Just a heads up, but uh, just keep on coming. Side down, 16. Yeah, I copy. Go ahead and come down, Chuck, all the way. Send it back up. It's definitely more wind than they were predicting. A little hectic with the tide and the wind. Everything's floating around right now, and we're trying to, uh, we've got good alignment on the bridge and the barge, and I want to come down just on this end until it comes within our guides here. The barges have special frames to catch the span and hold it in place. But the span won't fit until the crew cuts away some smaller pieces. Now, the span can connect with the barge. Okay, Scott, you have a copy? We're lined up on both barges. Let's come down at least one stroke, if not two. Okay, everybody down. The bridge releases the weight of the span onto the barges and relaxes for the first time in 80 years. As the, the bridge touches down on the barges, the cables are in a stretched and tight condition and the cables will essentially shorten as they, as they relax and as the load comes out of them. And then in fact the bridge itself recoils and will, will tend to relax or, or bounce up more than a negligible amount um, and we need to account for that. Jay for Scott. No one knows for sure how it will go. Chuck, are you here, me? Everyone is nervous. Jay, you're trying to reach Chuck or me? There's too many people talking on this frequency. Okay, Hector, you ready to come down? I'm ready to come down. Okay, both sides come down 16. We have to hit the target. We have about a six inch tolerance. It's gotta be right on the money. Okay, you far. Finally, the last stroke of the jacks lands the span squarely on the barge. It needs to be secured immediately. No one wants 635 tons of steel moving with the waves. And at that time, everything gets real busy. Scott, you have a copy? A copy. They connect the bridge to the barges with a specially built harness system. But even locked down, the span remains in a dangerous position still tethered to the bridge above and at the mercy of the swift currents below. Okay. 
All the cables must be cut and fast before the waves can make the cables pull on the bridge and cause it to collapse. At last, they free the span from above. But there's no time for celebration. They still have to float the span four miles into the bay through a channel barely wider than the span itself. Yeah, Dan, this is Jeff, California Insurance. We're, we're uh, getting ready to giddy up here. We're just about to... The giant span from the Carquinas Bridge, secured to the two barges, makes it a vessel over 120 meters wide, twice as wide as an aircraft carrier. How you doing? And every ship needs a captain. Yeah, finally. Captain Dan DeForge is a veteran Bay Area tug pilot. My job is 99% sheer boredom, but it's 1% sheer terror, as we say. With a vessel this big, it'll be a tight squeeze from San Francisco's Carquinas Strait, six and a half kilometers up the channel to Mare Island. In places, Dan will have just six meters on each side to squeeze through. A shift in wind, current, or tide, and he could easily run aground. spent many hours just getting acquainted with exactly what the currents are doing by the minute. Two tugs will push the colossal structure, but Dan won't be aboard either. This extraordinary challenge calls for extraordinary measures. You have to be in a position where you can see what's going on. And the, and the higher you are, the better off you are. The captain's chair sits 10 stories up on top of the span. Everyone waits while Dan climbs to his perch. He sits right on top of the middle of the span and he's able to see the structure, coordinate with both of the operators of the tugboats that are pushing the structure. He knows these waters and these currents as well as anyone. One of my pet peeves is I want to know when the baton is passed to me. And when the baton is passed to me, I want the radio silence strictly with us. Dan's first challenge, getting the detached span out and away from the two neighboring bridges. They cast off from their anchorage, and Dan gives the order. And I'm looking at everything to see which direction the wind's going to push us, which direction the current's going to push us. And, and then eventually, one of the tugboats, I tell him, half ahead. The widest vessel in the world slowly pushes off. And slowly but surely, this whole structure started to move. And uh, I think most people were just, uh, that sense chills up our spines, you know, because it's actually happening. The good ship Carquinas sets sail on her first voyage in 80 years. And her last. Now, Dan and his team must steer the new ship through the narrow channel. From the surface, there looks to be ample room to cruise through. But beneath the water, the channel narrows to less than six meters on either side. Dan doesn't want to rush, but he must also get through before the change in tide makes the channel even more shallow. It takes nearly two hours. But they squeeze through. Only one final challenge to go, docking the ship. This is parallel parking on a giant scale. 
and Dan has not one, but two tugs to maneuver. This was, I think, probably uh, the most difficult part of the job, actually, was getting the barges secured. There was a barge that was tied up alongside the dock, and we then had to straddle that barge, and we only had about 20 feet on either side. Slow and steady, the span slides perfectly into place. They've done it. They've cut down a fragile 635-ton piece of bridge, made it into a vessel, and sailed it to a safe harbor to dismantle. The Coast Guard can now reopen the shipping lane right on schedule. And the workers can finally catch their breath. Good job, man. Thank you. Yeah, worked out fine. Perfect. First eye view. Today's a happy day. I think I lost about a year of life already here. With the span now on land, the dismantling and recycling of the enormous structure becomes safer and cheaper. Less than three weeks later, the second bridge span comes down, and Dan transports it to the same location all without any major setbacks. Very satisfying. It's a great, great day.